This one is going to cover interpretation of soil parameters in coarse-grained soils. Okay, we're just the broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Okay. Sorry, not sure if everyone caught the little introduction. Um, anyways, we're going to start the webinar right away, and uh, this one's on interpretation of coarse grain soils. Uh, Dr. Robertson is the presenter, and feel free to use the question section of the um, webinar tool to type in questions as we go. I can either uh, respond to those questions or we'll save them for the end and have a, a Q&A period a after the presentation. Okay, well welcome to this uh, fourth in a series of free uh, lectures on the comb penetration test. This one is about the interpretation of soil parameters in coarse grain soils. Uh, the one uh, a month ago was about fine grain soils, whereas today we're going to talk about coarse grain soils. But before I get started, I wanted to remind people uh, that we do have this guide on comb penetration testing, and it's uh, you can download it for free from a number of websites. Uh, the main Greg website has it. I have it on my website, and also it's available on the Geologist Mickey website in Greece. Um, and so everything I'm going to talk about today and in our previous presentations is included in this guide, so it's a, it's a handy reference uh, to uh, supplement these lectures. And also as a reminder that following this lecture, uh, a PDF copy of these slides is also available uh, on the Greg website for you to download, and a, a recording of the presentation will be made available on that website and available to YouTube. Okay, so just as a reminder of what the comb penetration test is and what it collects, um, you've got these three basic measurements. Um, the standard electric cone nowadays measures tip resistance, sleeve friction, and pore pressure in a continuous manner while it's pushed into the ground at a standard rate of two centimeters a second. It's not strictly continuous nowadays because it is digitized usually every one or two centimeters, so roughly every uh, second. Uh, data is collected while you push the probe into the ground. So uh, we're going to look at interpretation of CBT in coarse grain soils. And in coarse grain soils, we typically think of sands, silty sands, sandy silts, gravelly sands, and sandy gravel. Um, and I'll talk about uh, the ability to push the CBT into gravels a little bit later and explain that. So as we've seen before, we have this table of the perceived uh, application of CPT for deriving soil parameters, and I've highlighted uh, the section on coarse grain soils, and one is high rating, two is high to moderate, three is moderate, four moderate to low, five is rather poor reliability. And you can see that it's mostly twos and threes for most parameters, so uh, moderate to high uh, application for soil parameters. You notice it's not quite as good as it was in the fine grain soils. Fine grain soils were very good for things like OCR and undrained strength and sensitivity, whereas uh, in coarse grain soils, uh, there are a few more complications which we'll go through today. But also note again, there's this asterisk that when you want to estimate stiffness or deformation characteristics, that if you measure the shear wave velocity, of course, you get a direct measurement of the small strain stiffness, and so our ability to estimate deformation characteristics is significantly improved if we measure shear wave velocity. And I'll mention that later in the presentation and show you how we do that. So just again a reminder that uh, you can estimate the soil behavior type from the CPT. And here's an example of the normalized chart, the one we encourage people to use, which is normalized cone resistance on the vertical axis against the normalized friction ratio on the horizontal axis. And uh, most coarse grain soils fall in zones 5, 6, and 7, and 8, so in the upper left-hand corner. And it's useful to remind ourselves that you know, coarse grain soils with increasing density typically have an uh, increasing normalized cone resistance. And let's also take note of this little arrow here that there is this zone that represents generally normally consolidated soils. And if you move to the 
left of that zone, so you have higher friction ratios for a given normalized cone resistance, then this is often an indication of increasing stress history, age, or cementation. So as you move up to the right in these zones up here, it's usually a sign of those increasing factors. We'll come back to that again later as uh, we reflect on how useful that can be in uh, improving some of our correlations that if, it, if it recognizes that exists. And as we had said in previous presentations, that this normalized soil behavior type can be simplified in terms of a soil behavior type index. So this is an index of soil behavior. And uh, it's really uh, the radius of these concentric circles. So there's an imaginary center of uh, the circles up here. And so by combining Q and F, these normalized parameters, you can calculate the radius of these concentric circles. So when the radius is small, you're in the upper left-hand corner in um, sort of dense coarse grain materials. And when IC is very large, you're down in the very soft fine grain soils. And so we know that when uh, coarse grain soils generally have a soil behavior type index less than about 2.6, you can see that there is a zone of the chart where that doesn't always work perfectly. But as an approximation, when uh, IC is less than 2.6, you're typically in the zone of coarse grain soils. And this illustrates this a little bit more clearly. It shows what these soil behavior type index uh, values are as you come down the chart. And uh, over the years, people have tried to um, use these charts as well as the soil behavior type index to link to parameters such as uh, plasticity of soil or the fines content. Here it's presenting some data from Turkey, from Setin and Ozan, and that was a paper in ASC in 2009, where they had a, a lot of sites in Turkey where they did boreholes adjacent to CPT and took samples. And then in this particular example, we're comparing the plasticity index of the soils uh, with the CPT data. And you can see that this boundary of a soil behavior type index of about 2.6 coincides with roughly a plasticity index of, on average of about 10. And so when IC is less than 2.6, then typically the uh, plasticity of the soils is less than 10. And so in general, sand-like soils typically are defined as soils that have a PI less than about 10. And in this particular database, you can see that 95% of the non-plastic soils did in fact have an IC less than 2.6. Um, people over the years have also thought in terms of, of estimating fines content from CPD data. And this is a plot. This was a plot shown in the publication by Idris and Bullinger, and it's based on data from Suzuki. And it shows that there is an approximate link between fines contents and soil behavior type index. And as the soil behavior type index increases, then the fines content tends to increase. But you do see there's a lot of scatter in the data. And that scatter is primarily due to uh, the plasticity of the fines. And so what you can find is that this boundary of 2.6 that uh, separates approximately sand-like from clay-like behavior, then you can have a soil that may have 100% fines content, but if those fines are non-plastic, the soil behaves essentially like a sand. Or you could have a soil with an IC of 2.6 where the fines content may be somewhere between 10 to 20%, but if those fines are made up of a very plastic clay mineral, then that clay mineral may dominate the behavior. So the soil may behave more like a clay, even though it only has about um, 10 to 20 percent fines content. And also shown on here, the red line is, is the uh, correlation that we had suggested some years ago uh, as a link between uh, what I called at that time apparent fines content and soil behavior type. Because there isn't a, a unique link between um, CPT and fines content, so I suggested that it was an apparent fines content because it also captured the influence of the plasticity of the fines. So it's important to remember that the soil behavior type is influenced by a combination of fines content and plasticity of fines. You know, in other words, soils with a small amount of highly plastic fines will behave more like a clay, and soils with a large amount of low plastic fines can behave more like a sand. You know, for example, a non-plastic silt that's essentially 100% fines can, in fact, behave a lot like a sand. So soil behavior type captures this combined influence of fines content 
and plasticity of fines. And the fines content alone is often um, not a good uh, representation of soil response. And in subsequent presentations when we talk about liquefaction analysis and the use of fines content, we'll come back to that issue. So uh, the factors that affect uh, interpretation of CPT data is primarily linked to geology and uh, geologic history. Uh, items such as uh, in situ stresses and the importance of the horizontal effect of stress, soil compressibility, which is reflected in the mineralogy of the soil, um, cementation, particle size, and stratigraphy and layering. So the CPT should always be interpreted within a geologic context. And to illustrate some of these points, I've, I've, I've shown a diagram like this in previous presentations where it's a schematic of soil loading. Here I've modified it to represent a coarse grain material as opposed to a fine grain material. And I've tried to illustrate several points on here. And one is that the tip and sleeve resistance is strongly influenced by the horizontal effect of stress. And here you can see it illustrated as a sort of a spherical cavity expansion as you push the probe in. And of course that's influenced uh, by um, both the vertical and horizontal effect of stress, and in fact more strongly influenced by the horizontal effect of stress. But later you'll see that we quite often normalize the cone resistance, and we typically normalize it with the vertical effect of stress. Ideally, we should be normalizing to either the horizontal effect of stress or maybe the mean effect of stress, but we typically use the vertical effect of stress because that's the only um, parameter that we know with any level of reliance. And so we need to acknowledge that uh, ideally the data should be normalized with horizontal effective stress, but we use vertical effective stress simply because we typically don't know the horizontal effective stress. But we need to recognize that and later it'll come up as a, as a comment about how horizontal effective stresses can in fact influence the results in older or uh, soils with a stress history or if you're performing CPT adjacent to uh, an excavation or a void or too close to an adjacent borehole where the horizontal effect of stresses may be reduced. Uh, the other item is that the, the tip stress must overcome any soil dilatancy. And so you can imagine if you have a very dense sand and that when you shear it, that sand has a tendency to dilate. And so when you want to push a probe in and you need to to create a cavity to push that probe in, then the tendency of the soil to dilate tends to limit your ability to open up that cavity. And the only way you can overcome that is if the stresses are increased high enough that the dilatancy becomes suppressed and the soil then compresses and allows the cavity to be open. We'll come back to that issue as it illustrates the role of uh, compressibility of the grains. And then again, this comment here, it's easier to overcome the dilatancy when the grains are more compressible. So for example, angular sands typically have lower tip resistance than rounded sands. And mineralogy carbonate sands, or, or sands with a very high carbonate content, tend to be more compressible and so therefore give uh, lower tip resistances for a given relative density compared to rounded silica sands. And then little point I put up in the corner here, as a, as a guide, um, when you're pushing into very coarse grain materials like gravels, if the mean grain size of the material is greater than the diameter of the cone, or approximately equal to the diameter of the cone, then there's a strong likelihood that you're going to meet, meet refusal, simply because you cannot uh, compress the arrangement of particles enough to open up the cavity. And uh, research using um, discrete element modeling has shown that the tip resistance is influenced or begins to become influenced by the grain size when the mean grain size starts to exceed about a third of the diameter of the cone. And then I also commented that um, cemented soils have an effect and so it's very easy to understand that if you've got coarse grain materials, if the grains are cemented together, it's going to be harder to um, open up that cavity because the particles have to move relative to each other and if they're cemented together they don't want to move relative to each other and so the cone resistance increases uh, due to cementation. So you can see that these, these various factors have a fairly big influence on the cone data and that's reflected later in how we interpret the data. So the other element is the uh, what's often referred to as the thin layer effect, and I've mentioned this in previous presentations, that 
um, because you have this approximately spherical cavity expansion mechanism where you push the cone in so the tip senses both the head and behind while it's penetrating. And so if you were to be penetrating a very soft clay and then enter a very dense sand, that uh, it takes a certain uh, distance to penetrate into the dense sand before the cone no longer fills the soft clay. And uh, so in this particular example, this was numerical modeling, but it's supported by both laboratory and field observations, is that the tip resistance in the dense sand might be a very large number, but the cone needs to penetrate a certain distance into the sand before it no longer fills the clay. And so data is caught in, in transition. And um, the depth over which uh, the data transitions is a function of the relative stiffness of the sand is being pushed in. So the denser the sand, uh, the bigger the zone of influence is and the deeper you have to push it. And so I put a little note here um, that for QC to reach its full value in the dense sand, the sand has to be at least a meter thick, at least for a 10 square centimeter cone. Or in dimensionless terms, the sand has to be at least about 25 cone diameters. So for a 10 square centimeter cone, which is about 36 to 37 millimeters in diameter, uh, the sand layer has to be at least a meter thick. So you can see in these examples shown in the dashed lines, if the sand layer is less than a meter thick, then the, the, the tip resistance starts to rise up, but before it can reach its true value, it begins to sense the soft clay layer ahead, and the tip resistance begins to drop back down again as you enter into the soft clay. And so you will detect the presence of a sand layer, uh, but you will not detect the full correct value within the sand layer. So in this particular example, the, the correct tip resistance might be over 20 megapascals, but if the sand layer is only half a meter thick, then the tip resistance will only raise up to about 12 megapascals and not the full value of over 20. So in the thin sand layer, QC will not reach the full correct value for the sand so the strength of the sand will tend to be underestimated. So again, that's important to remember that when you've got these thin sand layers embedded in a soft clay deposit, uh, there is a tendency you'll underestimate the strength and stiffness of those thin sand layers. There is a way for correcting uh, for it, um, and we'll discuss that in a later presentation. So the geologic context, most semi-empirical correlations are based on case histories in somewhat well-behaved soils, so these generally tend to be normally to lightly over-consolidated soils. They tend to be relatively young, Holocene, Pleistocene age. They tend to be silica-based or quartz um, sands, and they tend to be sedimentary in nature. So it's important to remember that a lot of these correlations have that sort of geologic context. Now there are a lot of theories for interpreting CPT data. Um, and they're, they're, off, they're getting more sophisticated today. But the major assumptions are needed for you know, geometry and boundary conditions, soil behavior and drainage conditions. So real soil is often very complex and it's hard for numerical models to capture every feature of real soil behavior. So most correlations do tend to continue to be empirical or semi-empirical in nature, uh, but they are often strongly supported by theory. So theory has, has, uh, has developed to a stage where we know the form of the correlation, and often we then actually go and get the constants based on uh, field observations. But many of the correlations, particularly in coarse grain soils, are limited to essentially clean, young, uncemented silica sands. And we'll, we'll come back to that point quite repeatedly when we talk about the correlations. So how do we normalize data? And in previous presentations, we've shown that the basic normalization that it came out of theory that it was applicable to clays said that the normalized cone resistance, uh, uppercase Q, is the net cone resistance divided by the vertical effective stress. And this works very well in clays, but in sands it tends not to work so well. And so um, over the years people have preferred to use a normalization. I pr prefer the term uh, uppercase Q again uh, with the scrub subscript T to say it's the total cone resistance in N, meaning it's normalized. Uh, but in the past, we've sometimes shown it as QC1N, meaning it's the QC normalized to one atmosphere. And the sort of the more generalized form is the net cone resistance divided by atmospheric pressure. And then this is uh, multiplied by 
a stress normalization factor, which is the atmospheric pressure divided by vertical effective stress to the power n, this stress exponent n. Now, if n is 1, this more generalized expression comes back to the original form for clay. So in clays, n is 1, but we know that in sands, n tends to be less than 1, and often down around the half. And so this is expression is, is the term that sometimes people are used to seeing for the SBT n value when it's corrected to n1. Now the origin of that normalization is, is quite complex, but a very simple way of thinking about it is if you think of the strength envelope of, of sands, we know that the strength envelope uh, for very loose sands is essentially a constant friction angle and that the strength envelope as the sand becomes progressively denser becomes more curved where the fr friction angle can become very large at low confining pressure but then at very high confining pressure the friction angle begins to decline back to the constant volume friction angle that is represented by a loose sand. So if you think of the strength envelope for dense sands being curved, this red line is essentially represents the stress path that an element of soil experiences when the cone is pushed in adjacent to it. It uh, rises up essentially elastically and then fails plastically along the strength envelope. And so if you just rotate this diagram at 90 degrees, you can think of it as the, the tip resistance as a measure of the strength and of course the vertical effective stress is the measure of depth. And so in loose sands, very loose sands, the, the tip position should increase approximately linearly with depth, but for dense sands it would increase non-linearly with depth, hence the stress exponent being less than one. And that the amount of non-linearity is a function of the density. So the denser the sand, uh, the smaller that stress exponent gets. And so some years ago I had suggested that uh, you could estimate the stress exponent based on the normalized soil behavior type as an iterative process. So you've got this generalized normalization form. So you would typically start off by estimating the stress exponent to be equal to 1, um, come into the chart. If you fall in the lower right-hand corner where the soils are clay, then you keep n equal to 1. But if you fall in the upper left-hand corner of the chart where you're in sands, then you um, uh, iterate and drop the stress exponent to a lower number and then quickly iterate to uh, get a stable solution uh, with a, a stable stress exponent. So I had suggested that uh, this stress exponent was a function of soil behavior type and also I had included a stress level component um, to estimate uh, this stress exponent. So this, this is somewhat of a, a new approach uh, and it's built upon the premise that uh, with increasing confining pressure, uh, even dense sands tend to behave more like a loose sand. And so when you get to very high um, overburden stresses, then even a dense sand begins to behave like a loose sand. And so this stress exponent of 1 begins to creep up the chart with increasing confining pressure. So if we compare the various normalizations, so this plot on the left, the solid lines are the stress exponents uh, that I've suggested that are a function of IC. The ones here in red is what Professor Bollinger had uh, suggested, and it was essentially a link with the relative density uh, of the soil. And uh, he, sh he recognized that uh, when the relative density was very high, in other words, the normalized cone resistance was large, that the stress exponent would drop to a rather small number, and when the sands were very, very loose, it would tend towards 1. He didn't actually suggest going all the way to 1, but certainly for very loose sands, it gets closer to 1. And so although they look quite different, you can see that in the zones of where most of the data fits, which is in the middle of the chart, they're actually quite similar. So uh, for much of the data, those two norm normalization procedures are very s similar. Uh, the only difference would be at a very high confining pressure where um, my method, the stress exponent, would tend towards 1 for very high overburden. The data on the right here was published by um, Setin from, from Turkey where he likewise was looking at the stress exponent and was suggesting a sort of simple, simplified linear variation that was very similar to the curved one that I had suggested. Um, the only method that uh, doesn't follow this approach is uh, the one that Bean and Jeffries follow that we'll touch on a little bit later for state parameter where they had suggested a stress exponent of one throughout. 
Um, now, although this uh, variable stress exponent sounds a little complicated, uh, it's actually not too bad because for, for most projects where the overburden stress is uh, not too far off of one atmosphere, then of course there's no difference because at one atmosphere they all give exactly the same answer because there is essentially no um, correction for uh, stress level when you're using one atmosphere. So one of the things that um, often you, you want to do um, that we could have discussed in one of the previous presentations is uh, if you need to normalize data for overburden pressure, then you sometimes need to estimate the unit weight of the soil. And if you don't have any samples, you can actually use the, the basic uh, cone data to guide you in what the likely uh, unit weight of the soil could be. And so um, a couple of years ago, I had suggested this sort of updated correlation, which just takes the non-normalized soil behavior type. Now, I've made it dimensionless by QT divided by atmospheric pressure here, so it's a dimensionless form of it. And I, I showed lines of soil unit weight, and again, these were made dimensionless by dividing by the unit weight of water. And uh, you can see that in general, as you rise up um, in the chart, uh, the unit weight generally increases. So as you go up and to the right in the chart, the unit weight generally increases. Professor Main had uh, suggested a similar relationship. His was based uh, only on sleeve friction, but uh, interesting enough, it, it in fact works out to be um, very similar to uh, this relationship. Um, now, one of the things often people want to do in coarse grain soils is they want to estimate the relative density. And the reason we do that is relative density is often, or traditionally, it's been used as an intermediary parameter. Of course, relative density is defined as the, uh, the relative location of the void ratio relative to its maximum and minimum values. So, of course, if the void ratio is equal to its maximum void ratio, then it's at 0% relative density. And if it's equal to its minimum void ratio, then it's 100% relative density. But, of course, one of the difficulties with the use of relative density is there's a lot of uncertainty associated with the determination of Emax and Emin, and so that's uh, often one of the complications of, of the use of relative density. And also, strength and stiffness is not always well represented by relative density, and as you'll see later, is the, the cone, and particularly the tip resistance, is essentially directly responding to both the strength and stiffness of the soil. And so it's not always um, a good approach to try and take this intermediary step to estimate relative density. So I'm not a big fan of, uh, of using relative density. I, I much prefer to go directly to, say, estimating friction angle or stiffness. Or if you're trying to estimate relative density because you're trying to get to something like liquefaction, then you're better to go directly to liquefaction and, and not go through this intermediary step of relative density. However, having said that, a lot of uh, people around the world still do like to estimate relative density uh, as an intermediary parameter. And certainly a lot of research has taken place uh, on that relationship. And most of it uh, was done you know, 10, 20 years ago, well, probably 20, 30 years ago now, uh, using large calibration chamber tests. So this slide, I, I borrowed a, a portion of this from Professor Main. It's a rather nice diagram to illustrate uh, calibration chamber testing. So these were large calibration chambers, often of you know, a meter or more in diameter, uh, filled with sand at, at known relative density, you know, void ratio, unit weight, et cetera, and known stresses, both vertical and horizontal, and various different boundary conditions, you know, either constant uh, strain or constant stress, essentially. Uh, so it's a controlled environment to study that link between the CPT and relative density in clean sands. It was limited to relatively clean sands because when you have a significant fines content, it's difficult to uh, uh, deposit uniformly um, sands that have a high fines content. So it was typically limited to relatively clean sands. Uh, and of course, very young samples. You know, these samples were often only a few days old, and so they're missing some of the effects of aging. And so out of this research were a variety of relationships that were often uh, cone resistance against, say, vertical effective stress and curves that would represent constant relative density. And there's this diagram over on the right that's now 30 years old uh, that illustrates that although they have very similar shapes and forms, uh, 
they do vary uh, quite a bit, and they vary as a function of the compressibility of the sand. So more highly compressible sort of angular sands would have uh, lower cone resistance for a given relative density and confining pressure. And this is often represented, and this again was taken from uh, one of Professor Main's publications, but it came out of a lot of the calibration chamber work. So all of these little blue dots represent uh, chamber data, and then Paul added these little yellow squares that represented undisturbed frozen samples from a number of research sites. And you can see that um, relative density plotted against the log of the normalized cone resistance, it turns out to be almost a, a linear relationship. But there's quite a wide spread. So say for a given normalized cone resistance of 100, then the relative density was anywhere from 40% up to 70%, with an average of around 55%. And you can see that there's a very big spread for these undisturbed samples. So, for example, at 40% relative density, the normalized cone resistance could be anywhere from 20 to almost 200. So, a lot of uncertainty uh, as a function of compressibility trying to estimate the relative density. Um, so, a relationship that I quite like is one that uh, Kulhawi and Maine had suggested some years ago. And it's a simplified form, and it's sort of similar to the work that Skempton did with the SPT. And it said that the relative density squared would be the normalized cone resistance divided by a constant. And that constant works out to be about 300. And then, then there's some corrections. One is for compressibility. And Kulhawi and Maine had suggested a small range. I've increased that now based on uh, the, the graph you saw a moment ago. They also suggested a little correction based on stress history, although this is very difficult to apply because we typically don't know what the OCR is. And then also a correction based on age that I'll come back to in a moment. So if you use that simplified relationship, I've plotted it here in red with that uh, number of uh, 305. And it, you can see that it does roughly fit the middle of the relationship, at least between relative densities of 30 to 80. It's, it's not a bad application. It's a very simple uh, form of estimating relative density, one I like to use, and all you have to do is change that one constant to uh, move the relationship uh, as a function of compressibility. Now, in some parts of the world, uh, there are truly very highly compressible sands. So in the Middle East uh, uh, and in other parts of the world, there are some carbonate sands. So these are, are sands that uh, in some regions are essentially derived from essentially crushed uh, shells that are essentially 100% uh, carbonate content. And we know that at the limited amount of calibration testing, it does, of course, move to the left uh, as suggested by that relationship. But I've shown here in red that it may not be just a, a simple linear transposing of the traditional relationship, that in fact it, it may steepen up the relationship. In other words, that uh, there's a relatively small range of normalized cone resistance for going from you know, very loose to very dense in these compressible carbonate sands. So it may not be as simple as just a, a, a shift in the relationship, the standard relationship. And um, I know that in the Middle East in particular, where they're building these artificial islands uh, off the coast, and a lot of the fills are these high carbonate materials, then the common practice there is to make what they often refer to as a shell correction. So the relationship for relative density uh, is going to fit well to the left here, you know, represented by these, these red lines. And what they do is they make what they refer to as a shell correction, where they correct the cone resistance, the normalized cone resistance, to an equivalent silica sand one. So they basically shift it over to the right to an equivalent silica sand and then estimate the relative density for an equivalent silicon sand so that then it can be used in the more traditional correlations that were based on silica sands. So that's not a bad approach, although you can see from this red lines that it may not be just a simple uh, constant correction, that it, in fact it may in fact be a function of normalized cone resistance. Um, this is a, an interesting plot. It illustrates the effect of age. So here's this normalized cone resistance divided by the relative density squared. In other words, this is that constant C on the vertical axis. And the solid line is the simple relationship that Kulhawi and Maine had suggested, which sort of had an average value of about 305 and increased a little bit with age. And then the dashed line was a relationship that 
Jan Lakowski had suggested some years ago. It was actually based on the SPT, but I've converted it over uh, to give a line. And then these dots are data from frozen samples from the Canlex project, a large research project in Canada, where we went to a number of sites and took uh, undisturbed frozen samples and did a lot of in-situ tests, were able to determine the relative density and had an approximate knowledge of the age. And so you can see that that relationship from Jan Lakowski is, is a pretty good representation. But it does indicate that that constant, although it's roughly constant for very young materials, does begin to significantly increase once you get past about a um, hundred to a thousand years, and certainly once you get outside of the Holocene age and you start to get into Pleistocene age, where you're much uh, older than 10,000 years for the age of the deposit, then this constant can get significantly larger and get double uh, the size. So you can see that age is another big uncertainty on estimating relative density. So you can see why I'm not a fan of uh, trying to estimate this intermediate parameter, and in some respects you're better to go directly to the parameter you're more interested in, which is either strength or stiffness or some response to loading. So in moving in that direction, uh, 20 to 30 years, uh, there's been moved towards using parameters like state parameter instead of relative density. And the state parameter is defined as the, the state of the sand in terms of uh, void ratio relative to its critical state. And so critical state uh, is essentially a locus here in terms of void ratio against mean normal stress on a log scale. And uh, so the critical state line represents the state that the soil will tend to move to um, uh, at large strains during shearing. Um, and so if you're um, dense of critical state, as illustrated here, so the void ratio is less than the void ratio at the same confining pressure, uh, then you're dense of critical state and you have a, a, a negative uh, state and you're, therefore the material will be very dilative. So if you ran a drain test, um, it would dilate up to its critical state. If you ran an undrained test, the dilative would lead to negative pore pressures and the stress path would move to the right. And if you were loose of critical state, then it would tend to contract to critical state in drained loading. And of course, in undrained loading, the pore pressures would increase and it would tend to um, decrease in effective stress towards its critical state. And Bean and Jeffries had first suggested this back in the early 80s, and they had simplified the critical state as a straight line to make the relationship a little bit simpler. And more recently, uh, other researchers, such as Bollinger in 2003, had said, well, you could actually represent it in terms of like a, a relative state parameter. So instead of using void ratio, essentially using relative density. This is quite uh, helpful because it, people tend to think often in terms of relative density. Um, and what uh, Bollinger did was that he uh, took all the data that Bolton had done, which looked at the relationship of dilatancy and friction angle and relative density for sands, for a wide range of sands. And he took the number that would represent a silica sand and uh, you, he could calculate this sort of generic critical state line for a, a, um, a silica sand. And plotting it over a very large stress range you know, clearly showed the nonlinearity of the critical state line consistent with high quality lab data. And in red here, I've drawn sort of that equivalent linear portion that Bean and Jeffries was working on, saying that over um, a limited stress range, you could simplify it down to a straight line. But it is useful to realize it is a nonlinear relationship. And it's consistent with our observation that we know that at very low confining pressure, like roughly one atmosphere, then if the sand is very loose, say a relative density less than 20%, then it's on the loose side of critical state and will tend to contract uh, if sheared. But a very dense sand at uh, low confining pressure will be very dilative. But at very high confining pressure, that dense sand begins to behave like a loose sand in the sense it will tend to contract. So just as we talked about earlier, when you push the cone in, essentially you have to increase the confining pressure around the tip so that the de dense sand uh, begins to contract so that you can actually open the cavity to push the cone in. And so uh, Bean and Jeffries have written a very nice uh, book on uh, the use of critical state soil mechanics for liquefaction. And they summarized about 30 years of their research activity. And they, they illustrated that the problem is uh, rather complex, depends on um, 
many factors, but mainly on the in-situ stresses, both vertical and horizontal effective stress, the sheer stiffness of the soil, the sheer strength, and the compressibility and plastic hardening of the soil. So it requires a combination of in-situ tests, ideally seismic CPT, the shear wave velocity to get the shear stiffness and the CPT to get the strength. And then lab testing on reconstituted samples to determine the critical state line and then often combined with some numerical modeling um, uh, to eventually interpret the state of the soil. But based on all of that work uh, and on a number of well-documented sites like those Canlex ones with frozen undisturbed samples, they were able to sort of simplify it down and essentially produce um, a set of contours of state parameter on the normalized soil behavior type chart. So this is my normalized soil behavior type chart. This is a little bit different because of the stress normalization. But essentially we get similar answers, similar contours, and you can see that as you go higher up the chart you get more negative states, in other words more dense materials. And so um, by looking at these contours of state parameter, what it illustrates is soils with the same state have a similar behavior. So you could have a clean sand, say up here, a normalized cone resistance of almost 100 and a low friction ratio where it has a fairly dilative state of minus 0.1. Or you could have a very silty sand further down the chart that has a much lower tip resistance and a higher friction ratio, but essentially the same state parameter and the same response to loading. So this is quite uh, instructive to see these, these contours and illustrate how the state of uh, a coarse grain material varies on the soil behavior type as a function of normalized tip and friction ratio. Now, also in the last 30 to 40 years, there's been a lot of work uh, on liquefaction analysis, a lot of it based on the early work of Seed and, and Idris. Uh, and essentially using penetration resistance, initially the SPT and more, more recently the CPT, to evaluate the state of sandy soils based on liquefaction case histories. And so out of that work came the concept of a clean sand equivalent used to evaluate liquefaction resistance. And so I had suggested the liquefaction method and it said that the clean sand equivalent was the normalized cone resistance times a correction factor. Often people refer to this sort of as a fines content correction, although as I said earlier, it's not strictly fine content to learn. It's based on soil behavior type. So this correction is a function of soil behavior type that tries to capture all of the features of fines and plasticity of the fines and even stress history, etc. And out of all of that uh, research on studying uh, liquefaction case histories, uh, there's a set of contours were developed of these clean sand equivalents. So the same concept is that two different soils with the same clean sand equivalent would essentially have the same response to cyclic loading. So you could have a clean sand up here that has a clean sand equivalent of say roughly 75 um, and a silty sand with a cone resistance much smaller but the same clean sand equivalent would essentially have the same resistance to cyclic loading or the same response to loading. So now if I if I put these two charts next to each other, the one on the left is the state parameter one based on critical state soil mechanics and a lot of calibration chamber work and, and a lot of theoretical work. And the one on the right based purely on uh, liquefaction case histories, you see there's a lot of similarity between the two. But this is really uh, very encouraging in the sense of uh, two completely different approaches. Uh, for looking at the problem of sandy soils. One, sort of a more theoretical based critical state soil mechanics approach. The other one based purely on case histories of, of sites that did and didn't liquefy. But they essentially came up with a, a set of contours that are very similar in shape uh, uh, as a function of the cone data, normalized cone resistance uh, and the normalized friction ratio. And so a couple of years ago I suggested that as a simplified way you could actually estimate the, the state parameter of the soil from this clean sand equivalent, which is very easy to calculate. Now if you follow that approach, uh, it will lead on to other applications. And, and if I talk now about estimating the friction angle in sands, uh, Professor Main had come up with this uh, simple correlation and, and had looked at data to show that it seems to work reasonably well. Now most of these sites are young, uncemented silica sands. And there's a little bit of an error in, in Paul's original publication. He highlights these two sites over here. These are two sites uh, that were two of the Canlex sites. Um, and he says they're 
uh, sands with a high clay mineralogy, although it's probably more correct to say that they are, they are, um, these are actually tailing sands, and they're from tailings deposits of a very angular sand, you know, because of the, uh, the way the tailings are produced, crushing uh, the rock down. It produces a very angular deposit, so it's probably more fair to say that these two are more angular sand, which is probably explains why for a lower normalized cone resistance they're giving a higher uh, friction angle. Uh, but following on that logic of the, the state parameter, um, Bean and Jeffries and others have shown that there's a very strong relationship between state parameter and peak friction angle. So if we take those contours of clean sand equivalent, which are essentially contours of state parameter, and then link it to uh, the peak friction angle, and that can be done with this very simple relationship that says the peak friction angle is essentially the constant volume friction angle uh, plus this addition that's a function of state parameter. So since the state parameter is essentially a measure of dilatancy, this is how you're adding on the feature of dilatancy. So when you put in the clean sound equivalent, you can get this relationship. So if I look at it, these contours, essentially this lower one is a peak friction angle that's equal to the constant volume, and then each one of them adds a certain number of degrees to the constant volume. So for example, this top contour is essentially the constant volume friction angle plus about 10 degrees. So on the left here, I've shown as comparison uh, the relationship that Professor Main has suggested for clean silica sands. They're essentially a constant uh, friction angle for a constant normalized cone resistance. And you see that they agree very well. So for example, here at 40 degrees, uh, that's pretty similar to this constant volume plus about six degrees. So if the constant volume is about 34 degrees plus six is 40 degrees. So you can see for clean sands, these would give almost identical answers. But the big difference is when you start to get into silty sands, um, where is the traditional relationship that only is applicable to clean sands, when you start applying it to silty sands, you start to underestimate the friction angle considerably. So the, the simplified method might start predicting very low peak friction angles where the friction angle is, is likely to be still significantly high. Also the nice thing about this relationship is it uses the constant volume friction angle, which is really a very fundamental parameter that's a function of the grain mil min mineralogy and the grain characteristics of the sand. So it captures that important feature. So for sort of rounded silica sands, this number might be 32 or 33 degrees, where for highly angular sands, it could be as high as 40 degrees. So it really incorporates that important feature of uh, um, sand uh, mineralogy. So I want to talk just a little bit about the application of the seismic CPT. This, this test has been around a long time now, so it's where a geophone is added to the standard cone, and using downhole seismic method, you can measure the shear wave velocity. It's typically done every meter. And so the nice thing about measuring shear wave velocity is it's a direct measure of the small strain stiffness. So the small strain stiffness, sometimes referred to as G max or G zero, is the shear wave velocity squared times the mass density. And the mass density is just the unit weight divided by gravity. So this test has been around for 30 years now. Uh, it's a very simple, reliable, inexpensive test. So if you're doing CPT, it's uh, very inexpensive to add on the seismic element. It's a direct measure of the small stiffness. So you end up getting a combination of tip resistance and shear wave velocity in the same profile. This is a schematic of the test. So you, you're pushing the cone. Often people have a steel beam that's pushed down against the ground, and if you hit the beam horizontally, it generates a shear wave that travels vertically down to the cone, and you can pick up that arrival. And if you do it every meter, you can actually calculate the increment time over that one meter uh, interval. Now, the reason that this becomes quite useful is that uh, it helps uh, uh, with identifying potentially difficult or non-textbook ground. So as I mentioned earlier, a lot of the existing publications are based on rather ideal soils, you know, young, uncemented, clean silica sands, whereas a lot of uh, soils don't always fall into that category. So by measuring the shear wave velocity with the CPT, we know that the shear wave velocity is controlled mostly by the state, you know, relative density or stress history in the, in the clay, effective stresses, age and cementation, and the tip resistance is also controlled by the state and effective stress, but to a lesser degree by age and cementation. So the shear wave velocity is a little bit more strongly influenced by age and cementation. So there's the, 
potential to identify the effect of those two. And one of the ways to do that is uh, back in, in 96, uh, uh, one of my graduate students and I, we had suggested this relationship of G over QT, so G0 or G max over QT. Essentially, this is uh, a relative stiffness. Um, so the stiffness relative to the tip resistance as a function of normalized cone resistance. And the normalized cone resistance is essentially a measure of the strength. So it's like the relative stiffness on the vertical axis against the relative strength. And what we find is that for most young, uncemented sands, uh, they fit within a fairly relatively narrow band. Um, so, you know, dense, um, rounded silica sands have very high tip resistance and very low G over QT ratios, whereas uh, looser sands, um, the normalized cone resistance drops, but the ratio of G over QT goes up. Um, but what we find is that uh, soils that are older or cemented or have some bonding, they tend to fall outside this band. And so if you have a soil, let's say, uh, the normalized cone resistance is, say, 100 here in the middle of the chart. So if you get a G over QT and G you get from the shear wave velocity, if it's around, the ratio is around 10, then it's probably uh, consistent with being a young, uncemented soil. And the uh, traditional um, correlations that we've been talking about probably apply quite well. But if it falls significantly outside, so if the shear wave velocity is significantly larger than one would have expected, then you're likely dealing with an older or cemented um, material. Now, of course, hopefully geologically, you know how old the deposit is. So if you know it's not that old, but it's fitting well outside of there, then there's a strong indication that it's cemented. And this significantly helps in the interpretation. Now, ideally, you want to go out and use the seismic CPT to measure the shear wave velocity, but that's not always possible. So sometimes it's nice to estimate it just based on the CPT data. And since we've been doing seismic CPT for a long time now, you know, 30 years, and we have a, a growing database, um, so when I uh, came down to California, one of the first things I did was to look at the database that Greg had with their seismic CPT, and uh, I was able to develop um, a relationship that covered a wide range of soils. So this is the normalized soil behavior type. And there were uh, several thousand data points plotted on this chart that helped develop these contours of normalized shear wave velocity. So you've got normalized cone data, essentially removing the effect of overburden pressure, and then calculating the normalized shear wave velocity. Um, we're able to develop these contours. And again, you see the similarity of the shape of these curves that as you go up and to the right, you get higher uh, small strain behavior. Uh, and so here's an example. This is a, actually a, pro, a seismic CPT profile from uh, downtown San Francisco. It's got mostly sands over some very soft clays. And uh, so the plot here on the right, the black line is the estimated shear wave velocity from that relationship I just showed you. And the red line is the measured shear wave velocity. And the two agree very well. And so that's a, so supporting that these are essentially young, uncemented deposits, which is what we generally know of this particular site. Uh, now, quite often people want to estimate the modulus, and quite often the Young's modulus, uh, to do settlement calculations. And the traditional approach was that Young's modulus is some constant alpha times the, the cone resistance. And alpha varies, and it varies as a function of essentially the relative density and the age and stress history. So it's, a, it's traditionally been a little bit complicated about how to estimate this alpha value. Um, Schmertman had essentially suggested a value of 2 as a lower bound for very young, normally consolidated sands. But you can see that value can increase quite significantly up to as high as 20 for over-consolidated um, uh, sands. Um, now what I did, you know, when we developed that shear wave velocity relationship, of course you can convert the shear wave velocity over to the small strain shear modulus and then that convert that to the Young's modulus. And when you do that, you get these contours. In this case, it's the modulus number for Young's modulus. But if you just look at the dashed lines, these dashed lines represent essentially alpha. So the Young's modulus is really alpha subscript E for Young's modulus times the net cone resistance, but that's approximately equal to that alpha times QC. And you see the alpha is just a function of IC. And you can see that it automatically captures that variation. So for example, a normalized cone resistance, say, of around uh, 200 here, that for a very uh, young, normally consolidated 
uh, SAN, then alpha would be about three. But as you become older and more, as the SAN becomes older and more over consolidated, you can see the alpha progressively as the friction ratio would increase and you come across the chart, alpha would eventually get close to 10, which if I go back to the chart, if I come to a normalized current resistance of 200, starts off at two and then can climb as high as 10 for more over consolidated material. So this approach sort of captures the correct alpha value automatically by using the soil behavior type chart. So uh, we've covered quite a range there of, uh, of issues and you can see it's a little bit more complicated for coarse grain uh, soils, but uh, CPT interpretation should be done within a geologic framework, so understanding the geology, both the age and stress history, as well as the mineralogy becomes quite important. Um, and the CPT can provide a reasonably good estimate of a wide range of geotechnical parameters in most coarse grain materials, but it is influenced by that mineralogy age and cementation, and that the seismic CPT can be very helpful to help you identify these factors of age and cementation. And also, as I commented before, it's best to view any parameter as a profile so that you maintain the stratigraphy and variability um, and, and don't forget that uh, important variability. So uh, the next seminar, um, we're going to hold it in, in three weeks' time, we hope. And, uh, what we'll do is now that we've covered uh, a wide range of interpretation, what I'm going to do is in the next seminar, I'm going to do some worked examples. So I'm going to use this software that uh, we helped develop uh, with uh, Geologist Mickey, and uh, we're going to use that software to illustrate some, uh, some good examples of, of cone profiles and, and show you how I would interpret the data uh, to get some of these parameters and also to illustrate how you could use it in design. So hopefully you'll join us for the next lecture, which will be on some worked examples. And just to close, uh, just a, a reminder to some people that uh, next year we're organizing the third international symposium on, on the CPT and we're going to hold it in Las Vegas uh, in May of next year, May 12 to 14. And it's going to be held at the Mandarin Oriental Hotel, a very nice five-star hotel on the Strip in Las Vegas. And so those of you that have been working on some interesting projects, if you have some nice little examples that you would like to uh, come and present and share with others, then the call for abstracts is out right now. So you know, uh, please go to our website and, and send me an email with your, your abstract. So that concludes uh, this lecture. Uh, what I'll do now is I'll switch over to um, some questions uh, that, that we've received during the presentation. Now, one of the first questions was that uh, Idris and Bollinger proposed a, a plasticity index of about seven as the boundary between sand-like and clay-like for liquefaction, and could I comment on that? And uh, I'm going to give a, uh, a presentation later devoted just to liquefaction, so we'll be able to go into that in more detail then. But essentially, most people agree that the, the transition from sand-like to clay-like behavior doesn't occur abruptly, and it certainly doesn't occur abruptly at a given plasticity index. It occurs gradually because it's a function of many variables of which the PI really is just a proxy for the clay mineralogy of the fines. And so it depends a lot on the type of fines, the amount of fines, and the mineralogy of the fines, uh, as well as the, uh, the, the sand itself. Uh, but certainly most people agree it does uh, vary from you know, nominally around 5 or 6 up to as high as uh, 15. I tend to use that PI of 10 as a sort of a middle uh, parameter. Idris and Bollinger chose 7. Uh, one can argue that's maybe a little less conservative since if you have a PI of 8, they would say it's clay-like and others might say that's not so true. I actually prefer to use the relationship suggested by Bray and Sanjay, uh, which was a combination of plasticity and the water content relative to the liquid limit. And so when the water content, um, I think, is um, greater than 12, they say it's less likely to be susceptible. And when the water content uh, is uh, less than 80% of the liquid limit, it's less likely to be susceptible to liquefaction. OK, another question. Um, does change in rate of penetration alter the results for dry soils? If yes, why? That's a good question. Um, something I didn't touch on very much 
was that um, for most coarse grain materials, but if I go back to the basic uh, soil behavior type chart uh, near the beginning, um, for most coarse grain materials, um, where IC is less than 2.6, typically the CPT penetration is, is drained. Um, so there's no excess pore pressures. So rate effects typically don't play much of a role. Um, and that's partly because there's no pore pressure uh, buildup. And since permeability varies by orders of magnitude, if you want to uh, push into a coarse grain material and, and go fast enough to develop excess pore pressures, you have to go significantly faster, like several orders of magnitude faster, which is just not practical in the field. So typically rate effects are very minor in coarse grain materials. Um, now if it's dry, um, there could be temperature effects. You know, if you, um, just we know that when we push the cone into dry, dense sands, uh, the, the friction between the sand and the steel generates a lot of heat. Uh, it's not unusual when we've done CPT in the desert uh, here in western US uh, where the water table can be quite deep and so you're pushing in relatively dense sands and they're dry. Uh, the cones come up very hot. So there's a temperature effect. Now a lot of cones today are temperature compensated so they're not overly influenced by changes in temperature. And then uh, even more so is that when you're pushing in dry, dense sand, often the tip resistance is very large. Here, and you see the normalized cone resistance could well be over 100. In other words, over 100 atmospheres of stress on the tip. And so temperature effects may influence the, the cone data a little bit, but the number you're measuring is so large often that uh, the effect is, is usually pretty small. So in general, rate effects don't alter the results very much, particularly in coarse grain soils and particularly in dry coarse grain soils. Um, so next question is a little bit longer and more complicated. It says, with load reduction factor design now in place for pile foundations, an important role that site-specific calibration for soil strength parameters play in the context of this load reduction factor design. How satisfactorily reliable is the CPT derived soil parameters and or other derived parameters? Wow, that's a good long question. Um, so I think the, the, the question essentially is revolving around how reliable is, is the derived parameters? And hopefully what you've, you've uh, realized from the presentation is when you're talking about coarse grain soils, there are a number of important factors that influence the results. And I captured them on this slide here. You know, in-situ stresses, mineralogy, cementation, particle size, layering, etc. So it's not a perfect world, but it's often one of the best things you have because getting undisturbed samples in coarse grain soils is extremely difficult. Um, there are methods such as ground freezing to get truly undisturbed samples, but they're very, very complicated. Uh, they can be quite costly, so very rarely are they used other than very big projects. So for the average small, particularly foundation project, um, they're not uh, done very often. Um, and so typically penetration testing is the only uh, option you have. And out of the penetration test, certainly the CPT is probably the best and most reliable. It's continuous, it's operator independent, gives you very reliable measurements. Now the interpretation to get them into parameters are a function of these, uh, these uh, geologic and uh, geologic history features that I've illustrated on this slide here. Um, but when you get into things like uh, uh, design, like pile design, then in a later lecture when we talk about applications and we'll talk about pile design, what you see is people don't go to any of these intermediary parameters. They typically don't go to relative density and, and friction angle. They quite often go directly to design based on previous uh, pile performance. So I'm not a big fan of going um, to design of things like foundations, uh, particularly pile foundations, via soil parameters. I prefer to go directly to design uh, based on CPT data. And so that'll be a, a whole topic on its own. Uh, so although this question was, you know, how reliable are they? Well, they're often uh, the best you're going to get. Uh, so it's a, it's a very cost-effective way to get reasonable estimates. And although the estimate may not be directly correct, it often gets the relative magnitudes correctly. 
in other words, the variability and the relative magnitude. But it depends on the design application, and we're going to have some future lectures uh, on specifically on, on CPT uh, for uh, applications of design, such as shallow and deep foundations. And when we do the, the next presentation, uh, where we uh, look at some worked examples, I'll put in a little bit about design applications there, because it's in the software, and it's a very uh, simple and pragmatic way to illustrate uh, design using that software. Um, one of the questions, what's the recommended method for determining constant volume friction angle? There's a variety of ways. One of the simplest ones is often if you've got a, a beaker of the sand uh, that you've got from disturbed samples, you just pour it out onto the table and measure the angle of repose. Um, that's a pretty good measure of the constant volume friction angle. So all of the fancy tests, uh, you can try them. Uh, but often the simplest way is you just take a, a beaker of the sand, very loose, pour it gently onto a table, let it form its angle of repose, and measure that angle of repose. And that's not a bad, quick measure of the constant volume friction angle. So another question, uh, uniform calcareous sands, can you use Sparker seismic data or other similarly high resolution seismic data? Ooh, wow. Um, I'm assuming the question is coming about, uh, you know, do you have to use um, seismic CPT or can you use other methods? And yes, you can certainly measure shear wave velocity using other methods. Uh, typically, of course, we recommend the seismic CPT because it's basically saying, look, if you're going to do CPT uh, in the first place, then it's very easy to add on the shear wave velocity. But if you're at a site where um, shear wave velocity is going to be measured using other techniques, then certainly you can do that. Um, the key, though, it has to be a geophysical method that does in fact measure the shear wave velocity. A lot of the traditional um, seismic methods actually are based on P wave velocity, and so they're not measuring the shear wave velocity. So either high quality cross hole or uh, down hole or up hole seismic methods measure shear wave velocity, but a lot of the traditional reflection and reflection techniques uh, actually use P wave velocity unless done uh, carefully in an effort to get shear wave velocity. So keep that in mind, and since you put in the word sparker seismic data, then I'm assuming you're thinking of um, overwater seismic, which of course is all P wave velocity. So just be aware that there is a difference between um, compression wave and shear wave velocity for a lot of uh, geophysical me methods. So explain about over-consolidation ratio for sand. Does it have the same concept of OCR for clay? Uh, the answer is, as is always the case, is yes and no. Um, certainly the concept of uh, OCR does apply to sand, so if you have a sand that is mechanically over-consolidated, so in other words, a sand that has been loaded um, vertically and then unloaded, and if, for example, like a glacier has come across a sand deposit and now the glacier has retreated, and so at one time the sand was exposed to a much higher overburden pressure, uh, relative to what it is now, then that's often referred to as mechanical over-consolidation, and certainly the concepts apply where there are larger uh, locked-in horizontal stresses. But for a lot of sand deposits, often there's sort of an apparent stress history um, that's based on um, uh, the geologic history. So in other words, when a sand deposit sits there for a long time, so it may not have experienced higher stresses, but it's, it's, it's sat there under its current stress for a very long time, like hundreds of thousands of years or even millions of years, then the sand um, deforms and changes under that uh, stress and can essentially lock in stresses uh, that have got nothing to do with mechanical OCR. And so for a lot of sand deposits, particularly older ones, it's age and cementation that uh, create an apparent OCR um, that is often treated like stress history, although in some respects you're better to treat it as an age and um, cementation effect. And that's why I'm a big fan of the seismic CPT, because it's a way of identifying this unusual behavior when you've got these very old or cemented or, or sands that have a, a, a complex stress history, and it's often captured by the seismic CPT because um, the shear wave velocity is very sensitive to the small strain stiffness, and the tip is more controlled by the larger strain strength. And so by measuring both of them, it gives you a sense of that, uh, that stress history effect. 
So the next one is, do you suggest um, correct QC from fines content to be used with clean sand correction for friction angle uh, or relative density? Yes, I think, as I showed, I think the trend in the future, you know, based on what I presented there on state parameter, I think the trend is going to be away from correlations that are based purely on clean sands to ones that are applicable over a wide range of sands. And that's because, of course, in practice, it's quite rare that you're uh, dealing with uh, perfectly uh, young, uncemented, clean silicon sands. Quite often, we're dealing with sands that have some fines content. And so, as long as you have data where uh, the sleeve friction has been accurately measured with the cones, so the friction ratio becomes quite reliable, then as the tip resistance drops and the friction ratio goes up, uh, I think the trend will be to adopt these uh, relationships that account for that uh, variations. I don't like to use the term fines content, it's really soil behavior type, where the soil behavior type index is, is an index of its behavior and showing that although the tip resistance is dropping because the friction ratio is going up, um, then the soil is becoming a little bit more compressible and so the clean sand equivalent uh, is maintaining a relatively high number. So um, you predict what I think will be much closer to the, uh, the correct peak friction angle. Notice I didn't say relative density, it's really the, the peak friction angle. Remember relative density is an intermediary parameter. I prefer to think in terms of either stiffness or um, strength, so either friction angle or modulus. And you notice that the, the, the curves that either are curves of, of stiffness or, or friction angle all have this similar shape to them where they curve over. So next question, relationship between QC and estimate for shear wave velocity uh, uh, was given for normalized shear wave velocity. How does the measured value of uh, shear wave velocity compare with estimated values? Um, not quite sure what that question is, but um, essentially I think it's related to that the relationship was for normalized shear wave velocity. Well, we have to normalize the shear wave velocity because the cone data is normalized for overburden pressure. So it's essentially removing the effect of depth so that they're essentially all normalized to the same depth for overburden pressure. So it's important to do that normalization. But you can convert it back to the, uh, the shear wave velocity as I did in this profile here. So what you do is you, you, you take the cone data, you normalize it, uh, you estimate the normalized shear wave velocity and then based on the overburden pressure, you correct that back to the measured shear wave velocity. That's essentially what the software did here. And so you compare the measured values. So last question uh, to conclude. Uh, angular soils are more compressible. Uh, will they give higher strength than rounded sands in general? And yes, in general. So if you had a sand at, the, at a given relative density, if it's angular, you tend to get higher peak friction angle than the more rounded sands. And so, yes, in general, angular sands do produce higher peak friction angles than rounded sands. And that's why you generally find that angular sands tend to be um, stronger at large strains. And, um, uh, but the issue is sometimes the compressibility, is that if you put them under high confining pressure, they do tend to be more compressible. Uh, last question then here, Kelly just gave me the last one. How reliable are estimates of small strain modulus from seismic CPT data? Well, uh, from seismic CPT data, I'm assuming you're measuring the shear wave velocity. So if you're measuring the shear wave velocity, you're getting a direct measure of the small strain shear modulus. So uh, it's pretty reliable. I mean, it's a function of how reliable did you measure that shear wave velocity. And uh, nowadays, uh, as long as you're not going too deep, um, seismic CPT for measuring shear wave velocity works uh, very good, basically from a depth of about four or five meters um, down to uh, about close to 100 meters, you get pretty good. In, in this particular example we're looking at, you can see that it started at about 5 meters, ended at about 62 in this particular profile, and you see excellent agreement between the measured and, and estimated values. Uh, obviously when you go deeper, um, seismic CPT doesn't work so well when you start exceeding a, a very great depths. You know, 100 meters is, is pretty deep. Um, it's not often we do CPT down to 100 meters. And certainly the accuracy of shear wave velocity uh, using seismic CPT does diminish as you go deeper and you're better to use other techniques. Uh, so for very deep holes, often people use um, uh, borehole techniques like PS logging uh, for deep holes. Okay, that will conclude um, um, 
our presentation uh, for now. Um, hopefully you uh, you enjoyed that and got uh, uh, out of it what uh, you needed. Uh, remember, uh, there is the CPT guide that you can download from the websites, which contains much of what I said, and a PDF copy of these slides will be available uh, on uh, the website. And our next webinar will be in three weeks' time when we'll go through some uh, work examples. So that concludes. Uh, thank you. Bye.